Good evening. Welcome to MTSO. My name is Kathy Dixon, and part of my role here is leading the Theological Commons Initiative, which brings us programs like this evening and tomorrow. We are so pleased to have Bill Gaventa with us. Bill is currently the director of the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability, as well as the Collaborative on Faith and Disability, linking a number of university centers of excellence in developmental disabilities nationwide who address spirituality through several initiatives. Bill's primary of experience and expertise are spiritual and faith-based supports with people with disabilities, training for clergy, chaplains, seminarians and community services staff, aging and end of life and grief issues in intellectual and developmental disabilities, cultural competence and community building. And he is a master at community building, you will all learn. He served as the president of the American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities in 2016 through 17. As a writer and an editor, he has edited newsletters in several books, written articles and chapters, and served as the editor of the Journal of Religion, Disability, and Health for 14 years, now as the associate editor. His book, Spirituality and Disability, Recovering Wholeness, has recently been released, and we are pleased to be offering that at a discounted price tonight and tomorrow at the workshop in the lobby. Bill and his wife, Beverly Roberts Gaventa, moved in 2013 to Waco, Texas, where she serves as professor of New Testament interpretation at Baylor University. Their son and daughter-in-law both serve as clergy in Austin, and Bill is the very proud grandpa of Charlie. As a person who has long learned from Bill as a student and a Summer Institute groupie, I am so pleased that he could come to MTSO, be here for the next couple of days, and lead conversations with all of you. Whatever brings you here tonight, welcome. I am thrilled that he can share with us, and I ask you now to help me welcome Bill. Does it sound all right? Yeah, okay. Great. <clears throat> well, what I'm doing tonight and tomorrow are two sides of the same coin, in a sense. I've spent most of my life being a bridge builder between the religious world uh, that serves and works on including people with disabilities in their families, in faith communities, and then on the other side, in secular services and supports trying to raise issues of spirituality and the importance of those in a system where the language and the theories don't often include that as an important area of life. And they don't know how to talk to the people on the religious side, and the religious side folks don't know how to talk to the people on this side. And then right in the middle, you've got people with disabilities and their families whose lives may be in both places. Uh, and part of the title of the book is about how can't these two worlds work with each other in ways that sees is, provides a more holistic perspective and where you can have a more holistic sense of what life and quality of life is about. And I've also spent 40, 45 years trying to get congregations and work with congregations and looking at all kinds of ways to try to encourage, entice, push, uh, challenge congregations to get involved in this area of ministry. And one of the things I've learned over time is that the most important thing for me to do is to find out how a congregation already sees itself, what they see as their sense of mission, what they see as their sense of goal, what they see as what they think God is calling them to be, what they or you see as what you hope your church is trying to be, and then work with them about how then inclusion of people with disabilities is not a taking on of special ministries, or not a taking on on something radically different over here, and not a taking on of something because a guy named Bill Gaventa says you ought to take it on, uh, not, and that most of the time guilt doesn't work very well. I mean, I'm from the South, you know, honey takes, catches a lot more flies than, uh, than uh, vinegar. Um, and, and, but what, 
what does work after a while is in helping people to see that this is a natural outgrowth of what congregations are already doing. And that for people with disabilities in their families, the strengths that a congregation has and thinks it offers to its members are the answers to the question of why are you a member of this church, um, are things that seem typical, typically normal but would seem extraordinary to many people with disabilities in their families, that it would just be a huge gift in their lives for them to have that same kind of feeling. Um, and the barriers have been partly because clergy never got any training around this in seminary. Uh, congregations will say, oh, we never did this this way before. Uh, social and cultural barriers where people were hidden a long time and away. And the, um, this particular barrier, which I think the rising tide of services and supports for people with disabilities has inadvertently created, which is people with intellectual disabilities need all kinds of special ed, special therapies, special psychology, special this, special that. Well, it's not long before any people in the general public think, well, I've got to have special skills to deal with these, quote, special people. And my premise here tonight is to just sort of destroy that special and just to say, no, what people most need is to be treated typically and to be part of just to expand that boundary, not to do something special, not to, to help empower you to say and others to say, no, you don't have to have training in special. I didn't have any training in special ed or IDD when I got thrown into this by a supervisor against my will in a clinical training program. And it's been the place where my life has been and I've been uh, enjoying it ever since for a variety of reasons. So practicing what we preach. What are you already preaching? What do you already preach? So think about your own church your own congregation. What's, what is it for your own church, your own core vision, your own core mission? How do you try to brand yourself in the ways we talk about this now to the community and the people in your community? What makes you special? What makes you unique? Uh, for the seminary, what's the kind of brand that the seminary does? And I've got a feel for that today about some of the ways in which it's trying to bring together a number of kind of really creative things, I think, um, uh, on behalf of the church. And what's the mission, what's your core mission as a family, as a parent, or your core mission as a person? Where do you see yourself called? Where do you see that called? So for a couple of you, at your church, quickly, what does your church, how does it define itself in terms of an elevator phrase about what kind of church it hopes to be and tries to attract people? Anybody got some? Offerings? Then it's something to think about because these days, sound clips and, pardon? A community. A, community, a church. We are family here. We are. What's on everybody's sign? That's a. Kind of more than I'm thinking about what's on most church signs outside. Welcome. Everybody's welcome. Yeah. There was an Episcopal diocese in northern New Jersey that brought a task force on disability, brought a resolution to the diocese and convention that said every church that had a sign that says everybody's welcome and that people with disabilities were not included should have to take that sign down. It didn't get it passed, but it got a lot of conversation going. Uh, about that, because when we say everybody, people will say, I'm part of that everybody. Who do you define as that part of that everybody? Who is that everybody? Is it a church known for its great ministries with youth and young people? Well, who's part of that youth and young people? Is it a church that's great with seniors and people at the, you know, moving towards the autumn of their lives? There's, it's estimated that each of you, you and I will each spend at least six years with some form of disability, like mostly caused by aging. So the question becomes, how do we support people who are, have those kinds of acquired disabilities, people that we too often call shut-ins 
Are they shut in? Or are they shut out? Uh, you know, how do we begin to look at that and look at those kinds of questions about how do we help them to stay part of that community? Uh, we, there was a synagogue in New Jersey that um, asked a new rabbi to come and to help them build a new and accessible and welcoming synagogue. And he was a rabbi with some hearing impairments. He had been, parents had been told they should send him to a center for mentally retarded kids when he was a kid, using the language of that time, because they didn't know he had hearing impairments. And he could, wasn't learning. And so he came and did, they did, they created this one of these wonderful new sanctuaries where you can drive up under an overhang in case if it's raining, if you've got a ramp and somebody, you can get right out, go in the open doors, and you go into a sanctuary that's in semicircle where people with, who use chairs can sit anywhere they want to in the congregation. There's not a, quote, wheelchair row um, or, you know, at some place. And, and there, there were two ramps on the side going up to the, what they call the bima in Jewish tradition, uh, up to, to the place where the, the uh, podium is and the, the, t the altar table. And what Rabbi told me was that uh, that enabled an older man to start coming back to church, to synagogue, who had not been able to come because of his physical disabilities. And he was able to come for about another, about once a month, twice a month for a year. And then he died and they had the funeral from the synagogue, which they would have not probably been able to do from the old synagogue. And it turned out, he found out that that man and his wife during the depression had paid the mortgage to keep the synagogue alive. So you think about what it means for people who've been parts of congregations for years, do they get to the point where they can't feel like they're included um, and are not welcome because of their own infirmity or some kind of disability? So what's your core mission? What's your core mission and what's your core values? Where do you start? Everybody's welcome. The call to praise, for everybody to praise is God's people. We're all called to praise the wonders and the glory of God. Are we the body of Christ, the church as family? How do we, do we see ourselves as that body of Christ? Do we see ourselves as that body of Christ as Paul defines it, uh, where the weaker parts are the indispensable parts of the body of Christ? When I was a chaplain for a number of years working at a center, and we were trying to get people with intellectual disabilities connected back to congregations, I sometimes called myself an orthopedic surgeon on the body of Christ that what I meant was that people, you hear these stories where somebody's finger or toes get cut off, and then you get them, you put it nice and get them to the hospital, and a good orthopedic surgeon will reattach that toe, and reattach that finger, you know, to get that sense of reconnection and to build that connection back to the body, and that will come back to that in terms of a way of thinking about that. Is your mission around a belief and relationship with Jesus? Um, uh, do we start with the premise that everybody's created in the image of God, um, as in Genesis? There's a phrase which I found that I found once that came my way that was just wonderful. That says, "In front of every person, there's a host of angels saying, make way for the image of God. Make way for the image of God.'" So if you think about that, I used to think about that with some of the people at the center where I worked. If they're coming in a wheelchair with one of these churches that's got multiple kinds of things attached to it, and they were coming into church, there's this host of angels saying, make way for the image of God, make way for the image of God. And what does that say about what we think God is, and what does that say about what we think people are? Um, I thought that was, had to be a Christian phrase, because it came out of the medieval, medieval times, it turned out to be Jewish. Uh, well, what did I know? You know, you just, you just never know. But, and are we all called to go forth and serve the Great Commission? Uh, for God so loved the world, you know, go out and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations means of all peoples. Or as Amos Young does in his wonderful book on disability and theology and Down syndrome and re-imaging disability, he's a Pentecostal. And he uses the story of Pentecost to say in that story, the, what was miraculous was that everyone heard the gospel spoken to them 
in their own tongue. So no matter what kind of language people might use, whether it be spoken word or whether it be written word or signing word or computer generated word or whatever, or even just nonverbal communication, and we'll come back to that in a bit, because that's the way most of us communicate, whether we think we are doing it or not. Um, and, you know, how do, we, how do we have and receive the gospel and share that in words that, and ways that people understand? The goodness of creation. Disability, it's so often in Christian history, been, has been identified as a part of the brokenness of creation or evidence of the fall or whatsoever, which is, I think, just terrible, uh, you know, to, for one, to, th to think of yourself or think of a disability, a person, as part of that fall. We are all limited and vulnerable. Be very careful with saying we're all disabled because I may have a limitation. I may have had a couple of bouts with major clinical depression, which I have had, but I don't have to deal with getting up every morning and having somebody dress me or having somebody feed me or the other kinds of disabilities. So be careful with the kind of phrase where you get to the point where we get to the place, oh, I'm recognizing my connection with people with disabilities. Oh, we all have disabilities. Well, be careful with that. Uh, you know, it's like some of my best friends are black. You know, uh, that it's, just, it's a too easy kind of sense of community and connection. But the goodness of creation, God created in the Genesis and it was all good you know, and gave people the capacity to name that creation. In John, the first part of the first gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and all was good. It didn't say all was, almost everything was good. It said it was all good. So if we talk about the diversity of God's creation, can we see disability as just one of the other ways of talking about differences that people have? And the ways that people are different and diverse from one another. Um, people, I've had congregations say, Bill, we, we, uh, we, we're not sure about having these people here come to be with us because we're all kind of the same here. And they're forgetting that the night before there was a meeting of the Board of Trustees and there was a knockdown, drag out fight about whether the church should do this or do that or whatever. No, you're not all the same. There's this illusion of homogene homogeneity in most of our faith communities. It's not really there, but it may be a different color or a different lab label or different kind of ability or whatever that kind of pushes that kind of boundary and says, how, what kind of diversity do we embrace as part of God's family? And then is church a sanctuary? Is the church a safe place? Come to our sanctuary and feel the presence of God. Um, we're going to come back to that in a bit, but think about that. A safe place. Church has not been a safe place for, for a lot of people. It's not a safe place if you can't get in. It's not a safe place if people are going to stare and make comments. It's not a safe place if a kid's going to burst out and you get a whole circle of stares around you. Um, as if that was some law was being broken that you didn't know about that was written in the Ten Commandments. Um, it's not a safe place if people say, or you hear people say in a church, well, if you just prayed a little bit harder and your faith was a bit harder, you wouldn't have to use that chair. Um, so we would never say that to somebody with cancer or something else. In many ways, we wouldn't say that. And if we did, Think of, think about what you, I don't know if you've seen the new book that's hitting all the NPR and everywhere else by the Methodist professor at, at Duke Divinity School, Diane Bowers, I think is her name. She is a young mom who's got a kid and the book, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. She's about 35. And she wrote a book that's hitting all the bestseller charts, which is, uh, everything happens for a reason, and other lies I love. Uh, and just telling her story about that uh, and, and, and that. So it is the church's, that's not supposed to be up there. Uh, is the church a safe place? I don't want to check for updates. Um, yeah. So where do you start? Think about where you start with your own congregation. If you're going to work on inclusive ministries, think about your own congregation. And where do you start? What are the kinds of things? 
And now what we do is kind of reverse the premise of inclusion. That the question and challenge is not how the church has to include people with disabilities because inclusion is a good thing, but often overlooked. But the question is how is inclusion and belonging just an outcome of how we are, of being who we are, and being who we say to be, and practicing what we preach, uh, uh, just taking what we already think is valuable here and widening the boundary of who that applies to, um, and who that attracts, and what we do as the people of God. How do you start anything in your faith community? How do you start turn that key? Uh, what are the steps that you do? Um, this one's like. If you can see the steps, I don't want to do it, I can't do it, I want to do it, how do I do it, I try to do it, I can do it, I will do it. Uh, you've probably heard that in yourselves and heard that in groups that you'd like to move along a path of one thing or another, or yes, I did it. Um, so the questions are not become not focused away from we never did it that way before, or we haven't done it that way before, but rather, what do we already believe? What do we already do well? What's our sense of mission and call? And then how might we expand that to address and include an unseen mission field that's right on our front step and in our neighborhoods, but we just don't recognize? I was, grew up a Southern Baptist missionary kid in Nigeria. My first professional job was at a large old institution in New York, upper New York State with 1,500 people one of the old warehouse institutions that was secluded from the world around it. And the first sermon I ever wrote to go, when I was asked to go speak in churches was to take the style of a missionary reporting from their work in a foreign country and talk to a church back here in ye old typical America. Because I'd heard my folks do that way too many times with slides as a kid. And... Uh, but by the title of that sermon was So Near Yet So Far, A View from a Foreign Land, that, that the world of disability is a world that seems like a foreign land, but it's right here amongst us. It's just sort of hidden in plain sight. And the question is, can we reach our boundaries out to do that kind of inclusion and include that mission field um, right here? And maybe the people and maybe the strategies are just hidden in plain sight. We just, just haven't thought about it. We just haven't named them and thought about what we need to do and who the people are. I'll refer to Eric Carter a couple of times tonight, one of my buddies and a special educator and researcher who has done an incredible amount of work and good research according to scientific social services standards about the importance of faith and spirituality in the, pe in the lives of people with disabilities and their families. And Eric is a master with a PowerPoint uh, presentation. He's just a magician. So if you want to know truthfully, I'm trying to be a little bit like Eric tonight. I'm not usually this kind of person. But, uh, but he takes a map. He would take a map of Delaware. He would have gone on Google Earth, taken a map of Delaware and de this area, come across it so you could see all the houses, and say the statistics are that two out of every five houses are impacted by disability. And then he would start making crosses on the, this one, this one, this one, this one. And you look at your community like that, and you wonder, if that's the statistical percentage, where are they? Where are they, where are they in our congregations? Not just people, but the people with families who they impact and other, where are they? Because we so often don't see them. It's a graphic way of saying they may be hidden, but not here. And disability and faith are two worlds that are kind of often separated, like Churchill said, between America and the UK, separated by the common language. You get into the world of disability and people start using all these labels and acronyms and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and you wonder, I just don't understand what all this is. And you get people who work in the world of disability, look at the faith world, and they say, oh my God, there's so many different kinds of churches and they do so many different kinds of things. How do you expect us to know what to do around that? So it's how do we learn to talk with one another in a language that helps to kind of bridge that, um, to bridge that. Uh, that one, the imperfect people welcome here, you'll be in good company. In high school, I was part of a Baptist church in Louisville, and there was a guy with cerebral palsy who had been there for years. He was in the front pew every week. His job at that point in the small part of Louisville was he 
took around a cart full of newspapers and magazines and sold them to the store owners. And he was passionate about the church. Uh, John, John Day was his name, John Day. And it, there, was a sto- there was a story that said would he joined the visiting team from the church to go neighborhood visiting. And he went down the house, knocked on the door, and uh, somebody said, well, I'm not going to. He said, welcome, come to Crescent Hill sometime. And he said, I'm not going to go to that church. It's a church full of hypocrites. John Day said, well, come on in. You'll, just, you'll fit right in. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, there's a skill, skills sometimes of just sort of naming things that get right to the heart of stuff around that. One of my favorite stories is about the guy who got tired of people telling him, walking up to him in the street, was in a chair, and wanting to pray over him or say to him, um, you know, your faith, if your faith was strong enough, you'd be you could be cured. And somebody walked up to him one day and said, my brother, if your faith was strong enough, you could walk, you could be cured. And he said back to them, if your faith was strong enough, you could heal me. So, and that's more biblical, in fact, than the, than the, uh, than the other way around. Um, and, uh, you know, so one of the wonderful things about disability is, if you're working with this, is anytime somebody asks the question about disability in relation to the church, turn the question around and say, how does it impact all of us? How do we do that with anybody else, not just with a person we've assumed to be the kind of new stranger? So both of those worlds share common human questions. This is what I got to talk about this afternoon at the Nysonger Center that's the secular side of this visit. Um, uh, the questions in the world of disability services, the values are independence, productivity, inclusion, self-determination, cultural competence. Uh, well, what is the, the independence question? It's the who am I question. What's my identity? And in America, we think we're to be independent and autonomous and our own person, self-directed. That's who we are. We don't talk much about our interdependence except in church. And we very rarely talk about our dependence unless it's a relationship to God. Um, But we, it's, you know, I'm not dependent on anybody. I'm not supposed to be dependent on anybody. You know, we're supposed to become more independent. But, and the the other core question, why am I? What's my purpose in life? That's the question of vocation, question of calling. Why are you here? What do you feel called to do? How do you make a difference? It's a question people come to seminary with. It's the question people have for a long time after seminary sometimes as we keep on looking for that. It's the question that the secular world answers by, you're supposed to be a productive citizen and you should have a job. And uh, we've really taken that into the form of idolatry and that's sometimes all we can talk about and all we do um, in many ways. I, and I confess, I would go to the confessional booth about that. And, but, and then the question of who am I? What, who's in, what community of inclusion? My wife, who's a New Testament scholar, says the biblical question is not who are you. The biblical question is whose are you? Whose are you? The biblical question is whose are you? You are God. You are part of God's people. I am part of this people. Uh, the question is not who are you individually, but whose are you? And how are we part of this body that responds to one another? Um, who are my people? Um, how do we go from being beyond a community to being part of that community? And then choices. How do I shape my life? What kind of power do I have? Why did this happen to me? What kind of power do I have to change this? The theistic question that comes up over and over again. Um, how do we do ministries with people and not just to people and for people, but ministries with people? as partners and collaborators? And why do things happen? How do we know? What kind of answer do we come to? Um, And as you know, with an honest look at the Bible, there are all kinds of answers to the why something happened question. You can take any kind of answer and find a biblical verse about it or story somewhere. And if we pastors didn't have the Psalms, we would be totally bereft in terms of pastoral ministry because Those are the questions. There are the lamentations. Um, There are the things where people cry and and is our God big enough, do we believe, to hear that and and to respond. 
So to think about some of the biblical kinds of themes that have boiled up from this area of ministry for me, but have also things that I think many churches are proud of. We would, most of us would say we try to practice hospitality and welcome the stranger to help welcome people when they come in. Some churches are very intentional about that uh, because you hear too many stories these days of somebody saying, I went to visit a church, went to the service, left, nobody talked to me. And you've got churches that are very intentional about that, that make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and in the biblical tradition of hospitality, of welcoming the stranger, as the angels who were welcomed by Abraham and Sarah, and the stranger on the road to Jerusalem, the biblical paradox, of course, is it's not the host that's giving the gift to the stranger. It may be the stranger that brings the gift to the host. It's the, those three strange people who brought the promise of a pregnancy to Sarah, uh, which they laughed off, if you remember that story. Or it's that bringing of this presence. It's the gift of that person and what they bring into that world, into that life. Um, and if you think about hospitality and the way it grew up in all three of the desert religions from the Middle East, it was a life and death thing. If you couldn't count on hospitality while you're going through the desert and you find a tent or an oasis and people welcomed you and fed you in the days before there were Motel 6s, uh, you know, it, it was a life and death thing. But they also, the people who were the host, relied upon these people coming from other places to tell them what was going on and to practice, you know, to share some news and to tell them about different parts of the world. They made, they were interesting uh, and made more, things more fun. Uh, and again, go back to that homogeneity kind of question. Um, think about, I've eaten in a couple of restaurants in Delaware already. One of them was seafood. One of them was uh, Mexican. Think about the diverse, the, 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 the dearth of feet, the, the loss you would feel if all the different ethnic restaurants in town just disappeared. And you had what most of us had when we were growing up, Howard Johnson's and maybe an Italian restaurant and uh, hamburger joints, uh, you know, that we enjoy the diversity. Parker Palmer has this one wonderful quote from the poet Ken Paget said, any God who created elephants and Eskimos must have had two, two or three kids of his own. Um, just that, how do we enjoy that diversity and welcome that and that's part of the enjoyment of about the thing of life. Hospitality, how do we welcome, how do we welcome people who maybe we, we don't know? How do we practice that? What are some of the steps? When someone comes to your house you don't know, how do you do that? How do you make a stranger feel at home? It all comes under the word accommodations. How do you accommodate someone with hospitality? What do you do? Have a cup of coffee. They can get in. Can you get in the door? Can they sit somewhere that fits them, whether it's your house or church or where they might like to? Take a seat anywhere you want. Can that really happen? Um, is there a place around the table for them? Um, uh, whether in church or home or somewhere else, in a club, in an organization. Do you know where the coffee is? Let me show you where the coffee is these days. Where's the bathroom? Let me show you where the bathroom is. That's an important part of hospitality. Episcopal Diocese in the Northwest Pacific had a phrase during their campaign on accessibility a number of decades ago about the importance of that, which simply said, Remember, if people can't go, they won't come. Um, and uh, you know, and, and how that, and whether that's possible for them. Um, I had an experience of going to a church in Mennonite country in Pennsylvania, where all the restrooms were so accessible, I almost felt out of place as a person who didn't have a physical disability. It was kind of really wonderful, uh, but uh, that was that. Where the, and are you invited into the kitchen? There was a conference in Rome two years ago where a guy about inclusion, where a guy came from the UK, and he said, when people, we invite people to our homes. We invite them in, we maybe don't let them in the front door if they're a salesman or the Mormon missionaries or something like that. 
we might invite them into the front hallway. The next step might be into the formal living room. But you know when you've really been invited to somebody's house if they let you come into the kitchen and sit around the kitchen table while you're preparing dinner or something like that. And he was saying, how do we in the church make sure that people with disabilities and their families feel like they're in the church kitchen, that they've been invited all the way in? Uh, and that is another way of saying, how do we put them to work? Uh, and how do we give them things to do and be around the table where the real conversations and the sharing is happening? Uh, and that's more than just the coffee hour um, and so on. Practice hospitality. Restoring the sanctuary. All God's critters have got a place in the choir. You know the song? Some sing high, some sing lower. Some just sing, some, what is it? All God's critics have a place in the choir. Some sing high, some sing low, some just sing out of the telephone wire, uh, something like that. It goes like that. I can't sing, that's one of my limitations. Uh, but it's that thing of everybody belongs in the choir. All kinds of voices, all kinds of people. And if we're God's choir singing God's song, do, how do we get all those voices in? There's a mom with a kid with autism in an Episcopal church who was asked to leave the service because her son was interrupting the litany by unintelligible sounds. And she got out into the, uh, into the vestibule and stayed there, and her son kept doing that. And it was still making noise, and the deacon came and said, would you move further? And she said what she realized was that the sounds he were making was in tune with the litany and the liturgy of the service that was going on even though not understood. Um, and the irony about that morning with the, the text for the sermon was of Jesus welcoming all the children and say, come unto me. Um, uh, or a, a rabbi who had a son with autism whose son began to kind of make sounds along with the cantor at parts of the synagogue service. And the cantor was the one who had a fit and said, he's ruining my beautiful music and singing. And the, the question had to be, what's more beautiful than uh, is it a, where you can't, where everybody can't voice their own song, or does it have to be done a certain kind of way? So in a world of stigma and attitudes about people with disabilities, is coming to church a safe place for people? And you'll hear so many families say, I have to fight everywhere else for my kid. When I get to church or go to church on Sunday, I don't want to have to do that. I would like to be welcomed in. Uh, I'd like to be part of that. Is it safe? Just as I am, as we sing in one of our favorite songs, just as I am. Um, claiming sanctuary in the Bible, someone accused of something that was hurtful or harmful could go to a certain v village, hold on to the pole and could not then, the, the pursuers had to leave him be or her be and claim that kind of sanctuary. They were There they were safe till it was found out whether it was a just or an unjust accusation or whether they were really deserved to be hunted like that. And uh, so is it safe or is our sanctuary a safe place? And are there different ways of praising God in that sanctuary? What's holy? What does that mean? Different ways of restoring the people. In the Old Testament, there are stories in the prophets about the, when Jesus comes and the blind shall see and the deaf will hear and those kinds of prophecies. But there are also the prophets who say, and I not, should not be talking about this because there's an expert in the back of the room about this, uh, Christy uh, Jones back there, you would, you would say, it would say, wait a minute, there are other prophets who say, and when the people go back home to Jerusalem from exile, the blind and the lame shall go with them back to reestablish that community. Doesn't say they got to be fixed before they go back or be healed. Or when they get there, they would be healed. But they are part of the people, and they too shall come. They too shall come. Um, all of God's critters got a place in the choir. Uh, do we really believe that? Do, they, do we really believe that? Um, and there are some great stories about people with disabilities singing in the choir 
and some great kinds of things happening in that and some funny things. One of the er wonderful things about this area of ministry is you got to be prepared for just some wonderfully funny and ridiculous moments. And don't get so blasted serious that we don't have, that we lose our sense of humor and some of the kinds of things that can happen in faith community, in congregations. There's a kid with autism in the UK who really, really wanted to be confirmed so he could be, get communion, Catholic. He just, that was his whole purpose. He wanted to receive communion. And the bishop came one Sunday before he was confirmed. And he, so he went through the line. And the word is, of course, you've got to go through the line and either cross your chest or something like that to receive a blessing. Well, this kid with autism got up to the bishop and said, you know, you're just really stingy. You got all those Jesuses in you, and you won't give me one of them. And, uh, you know, and then the next time when he was able to receive communion, it was just this powerful, powerful kind of experience for him. Or the Reformed Church, where the woman called to the front when she was being a member, the woman with Down syndrome, with her mom, and wanted to be a member, and the pastor asked the questions. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you know Jesus loves you? Yes. Do you love the church? Yes. She turned to her mother and to the pastor and said, do I have to get a physical for this too? You know, <laughs> so it's just, you know, you just got to be prepared. Or if you ask rhetorical questions as a pastor, you may just get some answers. And mostly what I say when that happens is usually that person is saying what everybody else wishes they could say, but, but are too shy or, uh, to, to ask that. But it brings again some, some life and participation into the church. So how do we recover that sense? Dan Elsher, who used to be the executive director of the Association for Theological Schools, has a good friend of his who's a Baptist minister. They were together in seminary. Baptist ministering in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And this church has done all kinds of disability work. Day programs, they've got some group homes that they've started, residential programs. And he was invited to speak there one time. And he walked in and saw the families and people were there. And he didn't say this out loud, but he said, Bill, what I thought was, finally, the whole people of God finally showed up. You know, like all the people of God finally showed up. It's, that, that diversity that was there. Is it this a safe place? Um, now, we gotta tell people who we are, that we, have, we live in a culture that's obsessional about that. Self-promotion, promotion of a brand, promotion of a community. There are all kinds of problems about that, but how do we tell people in new kinds of communication ways and let people know? Do you put, if your church is accessible, do you put that sign in the in the paper, they add the paper. So it lets people know that these people here have thought about disability and maybe people can get in. You know, how do we let people on our websites, those kinds of things, how do we let people know? Uh, where do we publicize? Um, what's the kind of message? And one of the things that happens, of course, is if you get known as a congregation that's welcoming and affirming and are including of people with disabilities in their families, the word will get out. And there, were, and there are many congregations these days, more and more, who are citing this area of ministry as leading not only to a growth in numbers, but also a growth in the spirit of the whole church. Not just small churches, but some very big churches, some very affluent churches. Um, Highland Park Methodist Church in Dallas, right next to Perkins Seminary, is probably one of the wealthiest Methodist churches in the country. And few years ago, their annual mission campaign, they featured their inclusive ministries because the pastor said, this is what we really makes us kind of who we are and says something about the whole spirit of this congregation. Um, and you, you'll get that from uh, other kinds of uh, stories about that as well. But remember in your messaging that 85% of what you really say and teach is not written down, it's nonverbal behavior nonverbal behavior. Um, I used to speak in front of, had chapel services with people with intellectual disabilities at the centers where I worked early on, and I'd have a group this big, and I either had to be with them and keep them with me in various ways, or they would fall asleep or leave. 
I mean, it was just, or act out. It was that simple. Uh, you had to figure out ways to participate, get people with you and see people with you, and to read kind of what was going on. Partly because I say some folks never grew up in a church and learned the normal, typical Christian habit of learning and sitting and looking like you're paying attention when you're really not. Um, and you're somewhere else. I mean, it's just, that's just what we do. I do that too, uh, especially when the sermon's bad or the speaker's bad. So, but the other question is when people come with disabilities who've never been part of a church or your church before, and then they break an unspoken rule about where they're supposed to sit or what they're supposed to do in the service or where they can speak and so on, and all of a sudden people are saying, oh, see, it's that person with a disability who doesn't know how to do this. They just don't know it. Well, no, they never had a chance to practice. Nobody ever told them. Nobody ever said, this is what we do here. Let us show you what we do here. How many of you have been to a church tradition that's much different than your own, which you grew up with? I always say this, the first time this Baptist missionary kid went to a Catholic church, I was very liturgically challenged. Uh, you know, I just didn't know how, what to do and where to do that. Um, still don't know how to get the right sign of the cross. Um, um, and, but so if, we've, if we want to help people come, especially people with autism, who, that's the hidden curriculum word comes out of the world of autism, people who are not good with social relationships, what is the kind of hidden curriculum of any group organization? What are the rules that are unspoken? And how could we help people learn those rules? So, because they want to belong, they don't want to do stuff that will act out, but how do we help people get that explicit so they can learn it? Uh, or have them come sometime not for the first time on Sunday morning. Um, heard too many stories about people from group homes showing up at a church on Sunday morning for the first time they're all sitting together with a pew and one together with a pew. They're anxious. They've never been there before. People around them are anxious. And what happens with anxiety and they don't know what to do? Somebody's going to act out. And then they'll probably end up leaving, and it's going to be not a good experience. Or the other thing will happen is the church will say, will take pity on them and say, oh, well, it's just because they're, re they're retarded or, or have a disability. And they'll accept it. And then they'll come back, and the same thing will happen. And then they'll come back, and it may get a bit different, but it may, it may happen again. And after a while, what happens in the church, I think, is what's called a natural, I call it the pity rejection syndrome. After a while, your pity runs out, and you get mad and say, if you can't get it, just don't come back. Um, you know, you draw the boundary. When the, the really tragic thing was that nobody ever taught people what to do, and Nobody ever helped separate people and had them meet friends or be with peers or something. So then they'd be on their best behavior because this is new. I'm not sitting with my family who I fought with at breakfast. You know, I'm sitting with somebody else, and this is kind of cool. Um, so find that culture and teach it. Think about disabilities the way it helps us to come back and use all of our senses in worship. We are the church usually of the heard and spoken word and read word. We're not very good with movement at times. We're not very good with different kinds of sounds and sights and touch. We like to pass the peace, but um, some other churches, you wouldn't find any people touching one another other than that. Um, smells, methods of participation. When you think about having to include people who are blind really intentionally in your service, you got to be aware of touch and the power of touch. And not to talk to somebody in the leave without telling them you're going, because then they're talking to thin air. So you become aware of the power of touch, and we know about the power of the healing and welcoming touch. Sounds, if you can't hear, you have either a hearing loop or an interpreter with that. And I love watching interpreters. I told an interpreter here that what First time I saw interpreters in action, it reminded me of my class in Biblical Hebrew, because what interpreter signs are get to the very grounding those words and physical actions, and you sit here thinking, how does that go word with, go with that action? And you say, oh, in Hebrew, one of the, work, the wonderful things that did for me was to take all these theological concepts and get it back to earth in terms of things like repentance, 
to be walking and just turn around in your tracks and go back in a different direction. Or the ruach, the spirit of God breathing into somebody. Or all the, those other kinds of Hebrew that got things much more kind of grounded in, our, in kind of who we are. Um, movement. Uh, a lot of churches don't move very much other than standing up. Um, um, creates a problem for people who are kind of itchy and want to move. Um, smells create... We can praise God through smells. We can also turn people away with smells. You've got to be fragrant, careful because some fragrances people cannot stand. It will make them sick. And it could be the cleaners used in your church, the cleaning agent used in your church. So there is really a hidden disability for some people around that. How do we participate? How do we get as many people participating as we can in different ways? And who's in the leadership roles? One of the most powerful services I've been to, maybe you ever, I don't know if you've ever been in a service where you've done that, is that a person who was deaf and knew how to sign read the scripture and the interpreter voiced the text rather than the other way around. So the, the interpreter proclaimed the scripture in sign language, but the voicing was done so if you had gone to a deaf church, you would have greatly appreciated that in terms of kind of reversing those kinds of things. Uh, lots of people would love to do some different kinds of leadership things in congregations. So this is a meme that's kind of making its way around these days. It tries to get at what exclusion and belonging means. We go from um, the, but we go from Exclusion, in fact, one way to even do this would be to take these people outside the boundary and put them over here, you know, maybe in an institution or some kind of thing over here or home. But then we go to, well, then that's segregation as well. It's, we, but that could be segregated program within a church. You could have a typical church, and then there's a special program where the kids never see the other kids or parts of the service. Let me, don't get me wrong. Special education ministries are a whole lot better than doing nothing, and it's getting people there. But if there are needs for people to be in a segregated classroom and sometimes, how do we make sure they get connected with people in other times and meet the wider body of the church together um, and other kids? And in religious ed, the most creative programs going on are the ones where you get a buddy and go with them to Sunday school and be their buddy and be the one who works along with that. Twice I've heard the story, it's a story of pure grace from families talking about going to a church where they were leery about going given their past experience. They went to a church, they hadn't checked it out. They walked in, someone came over to them and said, who are you, what are you, and uh, your son or your daughter, um, do they have any kind of particular needs and are this pretty quickly identified? And within five or 10 minutes, they would have a, another young person, a little bit older than that son or daughter, who had been had some experience in being a mentor for a child with a disability. And in five or 10 minutes, that kid was gone, off with his mentor to Sunday school, and the parents were left there saying, now what do we do? I mean, that's just pure grace for families to come in and say, you get to now go to an adult ed or you get to go do something. It's also something else, it's called respite care. You know, it's because they don't have to watch their kid for, for, for a little bit. Uh, but it's just terrific to hear those kinds of stories. And then people are integrated in the church, but sometimes sitting in the same pew. A friend of ours who worked in the CRC church did a lot of work on inclusion. She went to a church and said, Somebody said, oh, we've had this people from this group home coming to our church for years. Uh, they all sit together in the same pew. She said, do you know their names? No, they didn't know their names. Didn't know their names. And how, um, you know, so how do we kind of get past that kind of herd? And then inclusion, where people are really scattered throughout uh, maybe the congregation or the life of the church. And this is Eric Carter. This is not coming from an evangelism course. It's not coming from a church membership course. This is talking 
to families and individuals with disabilities about what welcome and inclusion means to them. And what he's put out to put together is that first is a sense of, I need to be present. I need to be invited. I need to be welcomed. An invitation and a welcome are two different things. I want people to know who I am, a bit about whom I am, beyond what you may see on the outside. I want to be accepted for who I am. I want to be supported in ways that I might need to be supported in the church, hearing aid, place to sit, you name it. I want to have a sense that the congregation cares for me, that cares for me. I would like to make some friends. I'd like to get to know some people and to be befriended. I'd like to be needed. I'd like somebody to say, hey, would you like to help out? Would you like to do something? Can we give you a job? I mean, people with disabilities are way too often become the designated receivers in congregation, that they're always being helped but never get a chance to help, that they never have a chance to respond to the call for discipleship that comes to them as well. The call to discipleship is not to us to be disciples to them. The call is to them to be disciples too, and how will we have find ways for them to do that? And if we can't find a way for them to do something, it says more about our imagination than it does about their ability. Because there are lots of tasks in a church setting that don't require a lot of skill. Or if they do require a little bit, somebody helping them, they'd have the still same sense of helping to do that and do something. And I'd like to be loved. And I'd like to be loved. What strikes you about that? This is what Eric Carter heard from families and with kids with disabilities and people with disabilities. What strikes you about that? The same thing that I as an able-bodied person would want. The same thing we as an able-bodied person would want, or anybody would want. And in fact, there are all kinds of organizations now taking this and say, how do we, how do we help professional associations say, how do we help people feel these kinds of things going on? So it's, if you want people to belong, you've got to do more than invite. and and just welcome the first time uh, to move from that to that sense of belonging. And we've been working on inclusive ministries for a long time. The kind of phrase now is how do we go beyond inclusion to belonging? In the world of disability, they worked on disability rights for a long time. Rights will get you a place in the community, will carve out a space for you, but it will not give you relationships. It'll give you the chance for relationships but it won't give you relationships, and especially friendships. Um, so sometimes it's hard to get in. Love the picture. Uh, that comes out of the 99 parable for me. Uh, maybe that one sheep couldn't get in the style, um, and the shepherd had to go looking. And because the shepherd, or the shepherd, there is, a, in fact, a poem that's about the autistic sheep who decided to go wandering out and because he wanted kind of like being outdoors and just wandered off looking for a cool place to be and that's where the shepherd had to go find him but to go find that one to help that one get back in and sometimes you got to do that kind of wandering to go find those people who are maybe the ones shut out you may find that their families who take turns coming to church because they have to keep a kid at home uh, and they don't feel like that, that that kid can be supported in the congregation so we got to go look. Don't forget the power of membership rituals and transition, baptisms, confirmation, first communions. Being part of those rituals are not our coming of age rituals and, and ways of saying something about membership. And there are profound stories about congregations who've done that intentionally and it's retaught the whole congregation what that ritual was about uh, and what, how, what that meant to be, for somebody to be included. I'm American Baptist, grew up Southern Baptist. Had a mom email me once about 20 years ago and said, Bill, we've had in trouble with our church, Baptist church. We want our, our son who has Down syndrome wants to be baptized and the church says they won't do it. And why won't they do it? Well, the pastor said, well, he didn't have anything to worry about. He's already in. It's kind of like the holy innocent kind of 
thing, an image about people with intellectual disabilities. And believe me, not all people with intellectual disabilities are holy and innocent. Uh, they they have some, sh share some of the same limitations you and I do. And, uh, and so we figured out some things to do, da, 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 da. And finally, they never ha had, they had a special service with an associate pastor with a baptismal pool and had a service and Kevin got baptized. He got baptized, came out of the pool. This is Baptist, now this is Baptist. Remember how important baptism is, believer is. Comes out of the pool and somebody points to the ring that was kind of left around the pool. Of course, it looks like dirt, but it was because the water went up a bit and is left. And somebody said, yeah, look at that ring, that sort of dirty ring around the pool. And Kevin said, that's my sin. <laughs> What's the tragedy of that moment? It was not on Sunday morning where the whole church could hear that and, uh, and, 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 just, and be part of that and just feel the beautiful revelation in a perspective that comes from something totally different. People may come to our churches. Do we invite them to be members, to become full members and what that means? Um, um, to receive, you've heard some of my communion stories. Um, um, every, and so the thing is, ha what is the, the big thing happening in the world of disability these days is everybody's got gifts. Don't focus on the deficit. Everybody's got gifts. You go from a strengths-based approach. It happens in recovery, in mental illness, and in other places too. But what are people's strengths and gifts, and how do you focus on that to help? Do you see people as half full or half empty? You build communities and congregations and seminaries from the half full side. If you focus on everybody's deficiencies and limits, you'd never have a Methodist theological seminary. You wouldn't have a church. You build community based upon our gifts and giving them to people. You don't build it on looking at, oh my God, all the needs we have and all the deficits that are here. Community development used to do that. Look at a community and say, oh, it has underdeveloped, how deficit, how terrible it is. And people would pour all kinds of money into that community and you know what would happen. Nothing would happen in the long run. But until the asset-based community development people came along and said, what are the people's gifts that are there already? And how do we tap into those gifts? And how do we help them to use those gifts for the sake of their own community? That's how you transform communities and, and help them come that sticks with people. So what are yours? Um, challenge you to do something in your church sometime. It's a really simple exercise. I love to do it. Ask everybody to take out a piece of paper and write, I am and then put 10 blanks behind it. And then in those 10 blanks, they can put parts of their identity, groups they belong to, roles they have, maybe habits, something that they're proud of, a great character. The one thing you are not allowed to put in that I am is a job title, because that's what is most important for most of us. And just do that list of what do you consider to be your gifts. And then get people to step up and name off those gifts. And there are two things that will begin to happen. One is people will find out that each had people had shared interests that they didn't know were shared before. So there's a conversation that wants to happen. I love dogs. I love, of course, in this part of the world, you probably is a deficit if you're not an Ohio State fan. But you know, but I, you know, or, but I, you know, this is these are qualities or these are relationships that I have we share in common. And the other question in a congregation or a community is, which one of those gifts do we not need here? Which one of those gifts don't we need? We need them all. We just got to figure out a way, usually for people to do that. And I've never seen anybody say, put on that list of 10 things, I am an alcoholic. I am, Bill would say, a person who had two major episodes of a major clinical depression, way, way down. Nobody ever says things like that because those may be parts of our stories and parts of our identities, but we're not, we often, too often see those as matters of shame and not of matters of gifts or something that we want to share. When in fact, 
The people who've written, the guy who written the book is everybody's got a gift, and oftentimes our core gift is the flip side of our core pain. Oftentimes we've learned by coping with a particular thing in our lives, we've learned how to cope with it and to do something about that, and that's where people say that's where your gift is. And you may end up feeling like that's an area in which, to which you're called for some reason or another. Um, that's, that's, I think it's a fascinating thing from a pastoral point of view is sometimes our weaknesses, well, Paul would say the same thing, lead to our greatest strengths, um, do they not? So uh, how do we see? Capacity, vision. We say it's more blessed to give than receive. Well, let everybody give. And none of us like to ask in our congregations. I think our churches are full of people who come to church hurting, wishing people would say something to them, hoping that something will say, somebody will say something to them, or that people are supposed to know what they're going through when nobody's told them, and then they leave feeling disappointed that it didn't get shared. Pastor said to me, the first time I ever mentioned people with mental illness in my pastoral prayer, the next day my phone didn't stop ringing because people knew it was finally okay to start to talk to the pastor. Uh, you know, what do we feel is kind of welcome in there, and, and how do we help us all to be receivers? Now, this is a very simple diagram. It took me 20, 30 years to learn this. If you want to connect people in your congregations through cross differences, don't worry about disability or stranger on the one side and, quote, typical person on the other. Find something that they share in common and have them meet there. Have them meet there. Quick, Madison, Wisconsin, they tried to get a bu bunch of men in the church to go over to be visitors in a group home that had people, with, all men with group home. Nobody volunteered. A month later, they ask, hey, there's some guys who'd like to get together on Sunday afternoons and drink beer and watch the Packers game. And how many people would like to do that as part of the church? Fifty guys volunteer. And you say, and by the way, there are a couple of guys at this group home who never get to go and watch football with a bunch of guys and drink beer and they have a disability, well, I don't care if they want to drink beer and have watch the Packers game, that's fine. You know, so, and what all of a sudden is you're inviting people to respond out of their gifts and strengths to one another, not out of what they don't know. Everybody gets called to use those gifts, and you end up finding out your whole church is like a potluck, which is always the feast is bigger than you think it's going to be, and there's always room for more. Um, and can we create... I think people have often said have gone from feeling fear about people with disabilities to pity, to then getting to know people and get angry because of what they faced, and then to feeling like we're maybe doing something for them, but they're doing something for us. And I'm going to close here, even though there's more. How many, right? We're about closing time? A little bit more? Okay. Um, but uh, this quote here is from a girl who had a sister, a sister who had a brother with severe disabilities who was part of a support group for her son, for her brother. And this support group, a support circle, circle of support or a kind of group action thing in disability is kind of a neat way that the disability world is kind of doing what magically happens sometimes in congregations where you get a group of people around the people to care and people support each other in that caring but support that person together, all together. And the sister walked out of that meeting one day and said, it's just awesome to be surrounded by people who are not sorry for what you cannot do. You know, and she was feeling the sense of being surrounded by people who didn't look at her brother in terms of what he couldn't do, but were sitting there trying to figure out what can we do, what can he do, and how can we do that together. Belonging in, ends up in the long run being remembering helping people to be re-membered back into the church, to be remembered back into the church. And when we do that, when people have felt isolated and excluded, that's redemption. When we do that and you're, you're healing relationships, that's reconciliation. Um, um, and some, just some quick things at the end. If you guys have got the stories and you've been doing this in your faith communities or have some of the stories, don't hide those stories under a bushel. I will tell you that you'll maybe go out of here tonight 
and you'll forget my theological points or strategy points, but you'll probably remember some of the stories because stories are the language of community, the language that we use to connect with people. Uh, it's not going to be theory or theology, it's story. And so share those stories and those moments that are both hard and those moments that are just great revelation out of kind of nowhere. Um, and they're wonderful stories. As you work on this, remember that there are limits and boundaries. You can't do everything. You can't do everything. Um, Fred Craddock, who's one of the best homileticians and preachers and has ever lived, short guy, about this tall, squeaky voice, incredible preacher, came to speak at Princeton one time, and in the middle of the sermon he said something about, just because everybody's welcome doesn't mean everything goes. Think about it. Think about it. So it doesn't, as you work to include people and help them learn what's the culture of your congregation, then the congregation also works to include and say, what, are, what have been our unspoken rules and boundaries, and how can we widen those out? But we also got to help people learn so that we come together at some point. And if there are problems, really, with that, that there are limits, and this can happen particularly in mental illness uh, at times, then uh, how can we work on that? And the story, one of the stories, and this happened in our little church in Princeton that I was part of, there were a couple of guys with mental illness who came regularly. They were buddies. And our pastor, if they got up at share joys and concerns time, we were going to be there for 30 minutes. And our pastor finally set up something where they would come in and talk to him beforehand uh, and then share some of that in the congregation. Another church set it up so that a guy who was off when he was having a tough time wanted to, needed to do that. They worked it out with him as a strategy that said, uh, we're going to, sometimes we know you come to this church with a lot on your heart, and if you start to talk, or during the, we want you to share your prayer request, but if you've got a lot to talk about, one of our deacons is going to come and get you, and we're going to go out in the vestibule and keep talking so the rest of the service can go on. And, you know, uh, recognizing and working with the limits in kind of an artful kind of way, um, uh, in that and learning how to, to defuse situations. Um, recognize that there are boundaries. This is a wonderful phrase from Tom Reynolds, who's a father of a son with autism and psychiatric issues. He said, can we learn to interpret provocation as invocation? What that means when somebody acts out or does something different, provocative because of their behavior. What are they communicating? And they may be communicating something like, this is not working for me, or this is too scary, or I've got to get out of here, or I don't like this music, or something. And in the best of what's happening in behavioral supports these days, people are not trying to modify and force change people's behavior like Pavlov. They are saying every behavior communicates something. And when somebody does something that's out of the ordinary, why are they doing that? What are they trying to get or what are they trying to get away from? There's often the two key things. And if you can figure that out, then how can we teach them a behavior that's different, that's more typical, to help them get what they want or get away from what they don't want? So it's called positive behavior supports, not punishing people to stop behavior, but how do we support them to learn alternative forms of behavior? People are doing that now with whole schools, not just with kids with behavioral challenges, with whole schools. Think about how much our religious educators would love some training in how do you deal with behavior and discipline, because that's often the biggest question people have about uh, inclusive religious education. And remember that acting out's not so bad. We, in fact, ask Christians to act out. Take your faith and do something with it. You know, act out. Cause some trouble sometimes. Do, go do some things that are perhaps provocative. The phrase is not necessarily bad. Pray, do something together. And recognize that our liturgy goes a week. Liturgy means the work of the people. And uh, what happens on the other six days for people with disabilities and their families? 
And one of the things that can happen is a project we've been involved with is using churches to help people with disabilities find jobs. Because if you, somebody's grown up in a church, that church knows that person. And what is that congregation? It's a network of employers and employees. And if you got a group of people with the right ideas together and said, all right, let's find, let's still start an employment program. Let's find Melissa a job because we know her and she's turning 21, doesn't have anything to do then let's figure this out and use the network we know, because most of us find our jobs through networking and do that. So we had a project that's called Putting Faith to Work, intentionally playing on faith and works uh, and that. And uh, we've, there's a manual and we'd love for people to do it. So the greatest gift is to simply being present for the journey and being missed when you're not. That would be the greatest gift to people with disabilities and their families to say, we missed you last week. We missed you. Where have you been? Um, wish you could come. I'm going to stop so you don't regret being here for too long. Uh, uh, but let's do some questions. But if that's some of the kind of, I hope you can kind of get the feel of this. Is this is not doing a special ministry, but taking what, who we are as God's people and just broadening that out to include people who haven't been included before and who are yearning for that and who may be in that great, labeled category in our society. Two of them now, the unchurched and the nuns. So, thank you. Questions? And if you've got them, ask. Yes? A lot of organizations, oh, a, lot of, a lot of organizations that deal with people with disabilities are, are public bodies or receive federal or state yep. money. So how do you, um, how do you incorporate discussions of faith and um, spirituality into public bodies or public funded bodies without you know, running afoul of separation? Talk them off the cliff where they're afraid first. Because you can talk about spirituality, you just can't proselytize. Okay. And come tomorrow morning, that's the whole purpose, is to how, do we, how does this area of life, I'm not, I don't want to be facetious, but it's, that's what we else, it's what I've spent the other part of my life doing, say, to okay. do, to live out the mission that you see in disability services is full of spiritual issues, you just don't see it. Yeah. And you've got to learn how to talk about it and recognize it and honor it to do the very kinds of things we proclaim we want people to have, which is to be valued members of communities. Okay, so tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah. No more lecturing tonight. Other questions? Anybody got a story? A tough story? A good story? Get in this area, you'll have some. If you have, the water's great. It was today earlier. Uh, come in. The one that always compels me, uh, besides the early ones, was at a conference when, in South Carolina when I told families to say, tell me your church stories after I did a talk. And if you ask that of a group of families, you're going to get stories. And you're going to get positive stories, about 30 to maybe 50 percent. And the other 50 are going to be negative stories. It's not going to be anything in the middle. And I heard a couple of great stories. People stood up and said, Mom, we said we took our minister to us, with us, to our IEP. We got everything we wanted. They thought he was our lawyer. Uh, uh, <laughs> but think about the power of a place where parents often feel disempowered to have a whole community sitting there with them saying, we care about what happens to this kid. We want to learn what's going on, da, 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 um, that, that thing. But one mom came up to me in the break and said, I couldn't get up during, I couldn't do this because it's still too raw. They had moved to South Carolina from Pennsylvania. Their daughter was labeled microcephalic, moderately retarded in those days. Small head. She had been in supported employment at McDonald's. She wore a uniform. She was proud of her job. She went to work. They got to their new place in South Carolina. She, there was nothing like that kind of program. Uh, McDonald's down there, I guess, hadn't heard about this yet. And she ended up back at a sheltered workshop. So you went in a sheltered workshop with 60 or 70 other people with disabilities. Well, at McDonald's, you're encouraged to act like an employee, right? 
Back in the shelter workshop, you take on the behavior of the community that you're in. And they start church shopping, looking for churches to fix but part of. And they don't get kind of the way prepared for any, in any way, do any talking beforehand. And one time, night they came back from something where they had tried to help her be part of a young adult group or youth group or something. And they got home, and this daughter said to her mom, no church, no more church, done with church, no more church. And the mom got into being a mom and saying, well, we've got to have a church. We're part of God's family. We need a church as a family. We all belong in church, but we've got to find one. And this young, microcephotic, moderately retarded young woman said, well, it may be God's house, but he's not home. But he's not home. So the question is, how do we help create home uh, in God's house for people who don't feel that? Thank you, guys, very much.